we turn to Aristotle after examining theories, modern theories of justice, that try to detach considerations of justice and rights from questions of moral desert and virtue. Aristotle disagrees with Kant and Rawls. Aristotle argues that justice is a matter of giving people what they deserve. And the central idea of Aristotle's theory of justice is that in reasoning about justice and rights, we have unavoidably to reason about the purpose or the end or the telos of social practices and institutions. Yes, justice requires giving equal things to equal persons, but the question immediately arises in any debate about justice, equal in what respect? And Aristotle says we need to fill in the answer to that question by looking to the characteristic end or the essential nature or the purpose of the thing we're distributing. And so we discussed Aristotle's example of flutes, who should get the best flutes, and Aristotle's answer was the best flute players. The best flute player should get the best flute because that's a way of honoring the excellence of flute playing. It's a way of rewarding the virtue of the great flute player. What's interesting though, and this is what we're going to explore today, is that it's not quite so easy to dispense with teleological reasoning when we're thinking about social institutions and political practices. In general, it's hard to do without teleology when we're thinking about ethics, justice, and moral argument. At least that's Aristotle's claim. And I would like to bring out the force in Aristotle's claim by considering two examples. One is an example that Aristotle spends quite a bit of time discussing, the case of politics. How should political offices and honors, how should political rule be distributed? The second example is a contemporary debate about golf and whether the Professional Golfers Association should be required to allow Casey Martin, a golfer with a disability, to ride in a golf cart. Both cases bring out a further feature of Aristotle's teleological way of thinking about justice. And that is that when we attend to the telos or the purpose, sometimes we disagree and argue about what the purpose of a social practice really consists in. And when we have those disagreements, part of what's at stake in those disagreements is not just who will get what, not just a distributive question, but also an honorific question. What qualities, what excellences of persons will be honored? Debates about purpose and telos are often simultaneously debates about honor. Now let's see how that works in the case of Aristotle's account of politics. When we discuss distributive justice these days, we're mainly concerned with the distribution of income and wealth and opportunity. Aristotle took distributive justice to be mainly not about income and wealth, but about offices and honors. Who should have the right to rule? Who should be a citizen? How should political authority be distributed? Those were his questions. How did he go about answering those questions? 
Well, in line with his teleological account of justice, Aristotle argues that to know how political authority should be distributed, we have first to inquire into the purpose, the point, the telos of politics. So what is politics about? And how does this help us decide who should rule? Well, for Aristotle, the answer to that question is, politics is about forming character, forming good character. It's about cultivating the virtue of citizens. It's about the good life. The end of the state, the end of the political community, he tells us in book three of the politics, is not mere life. It's not economic exchange only. It's not security only. It's realizing the good life. That's what politics is for, according to Aristotle. Now, you might worry about this. You might say, well, maybe this shows us why those modern theorists of justice and of politics are right. Because remember, for Kant and for Rawls, the point of politics is not to shape the moral character of citizens. It's not to make us good. It's to respect our freedom, to choose our goods, our values, our ends, consistent with the similar liberty for others. Aristotle disagrees. Any polis which is truly so-called, and is not merely one in name, must devote itself to the end of encouraging goodness. Otherwise, political association sinks into a mere alliance. Law becomes a mere covenant, a guarantor of men's rights against one another, instead of being, as it should be, a way of life such as will make the members of a polis good and just. That's Aristotle's view. A polis is not an association for residents on a common site or for the sake of preventing mutual injustice and easing exchange, Aristotle writes. The end and purpose of a polis is the good life and the institutions of social life are means to that end. Now, if that's the purpose of politics, of the polis, then Aristotle says we can derive from that the principles of distributive justice, the principles that tell us who should have the greatest say, who should have the greatest measure of political authority. And what's his answer to that question? Well, those who contribute the most to an association of this character, namely an association that aims at the good, should have a greater share in political rule and in the honors of the polis. And the reason is they are in a position to contribute most to what political community is essentially about. Well, so you can see the link that he draws between the principle of distribution for citizenship and political authority and the purpose of politics. But why, you'll quickly ask, why does he claim that political life, participation in politics, is somehow essential to living a good life? Why isn't it possible for people to live perfectly good lives, decent lives, moral lives, without participating in politics? Well, he gives two answers to that question. He gives a partial answer, a preliminary answer, in book one of the politics, where he tells us that only by living in a polis and participating in politics do we fully realize our nature as human beings. Human beings are by nature meant to live in a polis. Why? It's only in political life that we can actually exercise our distinctly human capacity for language, which Aristotle understands as this capacity to deliberate about right and wrong, the just and the unjust. And so Aristotle writes, 
in book one of the politics that the polis, the political community, exists by nature and is prior to the individual. Not prior in time, but prior in its purpose. Human beings are not self-sufficient, living by themselves, outside a political community. The man who is isolated, who is unable to share in the benefits of political association, or who has no need to share because he's already self-sufficient, such a person must be either a beast or a god. So we only fully realize our nature, we only fully unfold our human capacities when we exercise our faculty of language, which means when we deliberate with our fellow citizens about good and evil, right and wrong, just and the unjust. But why can we only exercise our capacity for language? In political community, you might ask. Aristotle gives a second part, a fuller part of his answer in the Nicomachean Ethics, an excerpt of which we have among the readings. And there he explains that political deliberation, living the life of a citizen, ruling and being ruled in turn, sharing in rule, all of this is necessary to virtue. Aristotle defines happiness not as maximizing the balance of pleasure over pain, but as an activity, an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue. And he says that every student of politics must study the soul because shaping the soul is one of the objects of legislation in a good city. But why is it necessary to live in a good city in order to live a virtuous life? Why can't we just learn good moral principles at home or in a philosophy class or from a book, live according to those principles, those rules, those precepts, and leave it at that? Aristotle says virtue isn't acquired that way. Virtue is only something we can acquire by practicing by exercising the virtues. It's the kind of thing we can only learn by doing. It doesn't come from book learning. In this respect, it's like flute playing. You couldn't learn how to play a musical instrument well just by reading a book about it. You have to practice and you have to listen to other accomplished flute players. There are other practices and skills of this type. Cooking. There are cookbooks, but no great chef ever learns how to cook by reading a cookbook only. It's the kind of thing you only learn by doing. Joke telling is probably another example of this kind. No great comedian learns to be a comedian just by reading a book on the principles of comedy. It wouldn't work. Now why not? What do joke telling and cooking and playing a musical instrument have in common? such that we can't learn them just by grasping a precept or a rule that we might learn from a book or a lecture. What they have in common is that they are all concerned with getting the hang of it, but also what is it we get the hang of when we learn how to cook or play a musical instrument or tell jokes well? Discerning particulars, particular features of a situation and no rule no precept could tell the comedian or the cook or the great musician how to get in the habit of, the practice of, discerning the particular features of a situation. Aristotle says virtue is that way too. Now, how does this connect to politics? The only way 
we can acquire the virtues that constitute the good life is to exercise the virtues to have certain habits inculcated in us and then to engage in the practice of deliberating with citizens about the nature of the good. That's what politics is ultimately about. The acquisition of civic virtue, of this capacity to deliberate among equals, that's something we couldn't get living a life alone outside of politics. And so that's why in order to realize our nature, we have to engage in politics. And that's why those who are greatest in civic virtue, like Pericles, are the ones who properly have the greatest measure of offices and honors. So the argument about the distribution of offices and honors has this teleological character, but also an honorific dimension. Because part of the point of politics is to honor people like Pericles. It isn't just that Pericles should have the dominant say because he has the best judgment and that will lead to the best outcomes, to the best consequences for the citizens. That's true and that's important. But a further reason people like Pericles should have the greatest measure of offices and honors and political authority and sway in the polis is that part of the point of politics is to single out and honor those who possess the relevant virtue, in this case civic virtue, civic excellence, practical wisdom to the fullest extent. That's the honorific dimension bound up with Aristotle's account of politics. Here's an example that shows the link in a contemporary controversy the link to which Aristotle draws our attention between arguments about justice and rights on the one hand and figuring out the telos or the purpose of a social practice on the other. Not only that, the case of Casey Martin and his golf cart also brings out the link between debates about what the purpose of a social practice or a game is, on the one hand, and the question of what qualities should be honored on the other. The link between teleology and honor-based principles of distributive justice. Who was Casey Martin? Well, Casey Martin is a very good golfer, able to compete at the highest levels of golf, but for one thing. He has a rare circulatory problem in his leg that makes it very difficult for him to walk. Not only difficult, but dangerous. And so he asked the PGA, which governs the Pro Tour in golf, to be able to use a golf cart when he competed in professional tournaments. PGA said no, and he sued under the American for Disabilities Act. He sued in a case that went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The question the Supreme Court had to answer was, does Casey Martin have a right that the PGA provide him, allow him to use the golf cart on the tour or not? How many here think that, from a moral point of view, Casey Martin should have a right to use a golf cart? And how many think that he should not have a right to a golf cart in the tournaments? So the majority are sympathetic to Casey Martin's right, though a substantial minority disagree. Let's first hear from those of you who would rule against Casey Martin. Why would you not say that the PGA must give him a golf cart? 
Yes. Since the inception of golf, because it's been part of the sport, it's now intrinsically part of golf, walking the course. And thus, because it's intrinsic to golf, I'd argue that not being able to walk the course is just not being able to perform an aspect of the sport which is necessary to performing at a professional level. Good. Stay there for a minute. What's your name? Tommy. Are you a golfer, by the way, Tom? Uh, not so much, but yeah, a little bit. Are there any, are there any uh, golfers here? I mean, real golfers? Thank you, Professor. That was no, no. I, I'm just taking your word for it. Who are there? Is there someone here on the golf team? Yes? Tell us your name and uh, tell us what you think. Uh, my name is Michael, and I usually take a cart, so it's probably the wrong, <laughs> <laughs> probably the wrong person to ask. Is that why your hand went up slowly when I... Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, but Tom is saying, let's... Uh, Tom said a minute ago that at least at the professional level, walking the course is essential to the game. Do you agree? I would, yes. You do? Then why do you take a cart? <laughs> and you call yourself a golfer? No, right. I'm, no, 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 no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. What, what, do, you say, what do you say to that? I, when I have walked a course, it, it does add tremendously to the, to the game. It makes it a lot harder, it really does. Yeah? All right, let's, let's hear Michael and Tom stay there. Let's hear from people who uh, say that he should have a right to a golf cart. Why? Who's prepared to defend that position? Yes. Well, I think the PGA should definitely be required um, to give him a golf cart because they argue in the decision that it's not just a matter of he's not, not experiencing fatigue. For him, he's still walking about a mile. The cart can't go everywhere with him. Um, and in that mile, he's still experiencing more fatigue and pain than a healthy player would. So it's not as if you're removing the disadvantage. What's your name? Riva. Riva, what do you say to uh, Tom's point that walking the course is essential to the game? It would be as if um, a disabled player could play in the NBA uh, but not have to uh, run up and down the court? Well, I think there are two, um, two responses to that. First, I don't think it's, it's essential to the game because um, most golfers who play, particularly recreationally, don't play with a cart. Like and Michael. On several, like yeah. Michael. <laughs> and uh, and right. on several of the tours, um, you can play with a cart. On the Senior PGA Tour, on the Nike Tour, um, in a lot of the college events, and those events are just as competitive and just as high level as the PGA Tour. So really, it's just a matter of selective reasoning if you argue that it's um, an important part of the sport. But even if it is, he still does have to walk. He still plays golf standing up. It's not as if he's playing golf from a wheelchair. All right. Uh, who, who else? Go ahead. I think the whole point of a competition is that it calls out the best, you know, from the second best or from the third best. And when we're talking about the national level, we're talking about, you know, the highest of the highest. And, and I think the, per, uh, what they're um, arguing about here is the purpose of competition. And I, I think in the sake of competition, you can't change the rules. So the purpose of the competition includes walking. That's an essential, you agree with Tom, and what's your name? David. The Supreme Court ruled that the PGA did have to accommodate Casey Martin. And they did it on grounds that Riva mentioned, that walking isn't really part of an essential part of the game. They cited testimony saying that walking the court consumes no more calories than you get eating a Big Mac. That's what walking is in golf, according to the majority. Scalia was in dissent. Justice Scalia agreed with David. He said, there is no purpose, it's not, and it's certainly not for courts to try to figure out the essential purpose of golf. Golf, like any game, is strictly for amusement. And if there's a group that wants to have one version of the game, they can have that version of the game. And the market can decide whether people are amused and like and show up for that and watch the television broadcasts. Scalia's dissent was an anti-Aristotelian dissent. Because notice two things about the argument. First, 
we're thrust into a discussion about what the essential nature or purpose or telos of golf really is. Does it include walking? And here's something I think is rumbling beneath the surface of this debate. Whether walking partly determines whether golf is really an athletic competition. After all, the ball sits still. You have to put it in a hole. It's, is it more like basketball, baseball, and football, golf, an athletic competition? Or is it more like billiards? <laughs> the ball sits still there, too. You can be out of shape and succeed. It involves skill, but not athletic skill. Could it be that those professional golfers who excel at golf have a stake in golf being honored and recognized as an athletic event, not just a game of skill like billiards? And if that's what's at stake, then we have a debate about the purpose, the teleological dimension, and also a debate about honor. What virtues, really, does the game of golf honor and recognize? Two questions to which Aristotle directs our attention. We'll continue on this case next time.